All right, so you may have seen this in previous videos, but in the background, right over my shoulder, usually, I have my golden duck. Um, the fact that it's golden is a little concerning. Reminds me a little bit of the kind of golden calf incident, which is, uh, yeah, cause for concern. But I love my golden duck because I love ducks. In fact, I got to give you some videos of ducks real quick. Okay, so why am I bringing up my love of ducks? Well, because I want you to think about a kind of saying about ducks. Uh, have you ever heard the saying, keeping your ducks in a row, right? It's another way of sort of talking about staying organized, right? Making sure things are kind of in sequence and in order. Again, ducks. Keeping your ducks in a row is what I want you to think about today because in this video, we're gonna talk about writing history essays. This is the Watkins Guide to Writing History Essays. And my main uh, advice for you for writing history essays is to always keep your ducks in a row. Let's get going. In this video, I'm going to give you my guide to writing history essays. Now, there are lots of different types of essays that you could write for a history class, but this is going to be sort of a simplified list of, of tips and suggestions and strategies to approaching kind of a broad range of essays that you could write in history. We're going to break this down in a few ways. First, we're going to talk a little bit about what an analytical essay is. Then second, we're going to think a little bit about planning. How do you plan your writing of that essay? Then third, we're going to look at the introduction. Uh, fourth, the body of a, a paragraph or body of an essay. And then fifth, finally, what to do in a conclusion. Okay, first things first, what is an analytical essay? Okay, what is an analytical essay? All right, well, maybe the best way to approach this or to begin with is just to think about the word analysis. Well, analysis is a Greek word. It comes from sort of Greek origins, and it essentially means uh, sort of breaking apart something to understand it better. Analysis is the work of breaking something apart to kind of get to know it or comprehend it in a better way. We might think of analysis as essentially like dissection, right? Think of when in high school or whenever you had to like dissect a worm, you would cut it open, break it apart, label it in order to understand how that worm worked better. And you're welcome for not putting one of the millions of other images that came up when I searched dissection worm in Google. Gross. So analytical essays are essays about breaking something apart to understand it better. Analytical essays tend to start with questions, questions usually for historical essays about the past, about the how and why of the past, and then follow with answers to those questions. Answers take the form of arguments, interpretations based on evidence. That's what an analytical essay essentially is, understanding something about the past better by asking a question about it and then answering that question in a specific evidence-based way. So what I want you to think about when you are writing history essays is I want you to think of yourself less as a storyteller and more as a lawyer. You see, lawyers have analytical mentalities. Their job is to present arguments in very analytical ways. That's the kind of thinking and the kind of approach and writing that historians use. It's to sort of break down a question, come up with a specific response, and then to present the evidence in favor of that interpretation or that response. 
Next thing we're going to talk about is planning. How do you approach writing an analytical essay and what should you do sort of in the buildup of the assignment? Okay, so if analytical essays are essentially just essays that present an argument, we need to talk about what is an argument. And there are essentially four components of any good argument. The first is a thesis. A thesis is the main thing that you're trying to prove, or put differently, the main answer to the question that you ask at the beginning of your paper. The second component are reasons. Reasons are essentially the points that you make to support the thesis, the kind of argumentative, analytical, rhetorical points that you make in order to back up your thesis. Third is evidence. Remember the last video about what history is? History is an empirical discipline, which means that it's evidence-based. Historians have to support their arguments, their theses, with evidence. Then finally, the final component of an argument is uh, what we call warrants. This is a little harder to understand, but a warrant is essentially a rhetorical response to a potential counter argument, right? Or a potential objection to um, the person's argument. It's maybe easier if I just give you an example. So let's say we're writing an analytical essay about, um, let's say, pizza. Okay, we might start with, well, the very unhistorical question, uh, what's the best kind of pizza? So question, what do we start off with? Well, response to that question. And my response is going to be none other than Hawaiian pizza. That's my thesis. The best kind of pizza is in fact Hawaiian pizza. All right, so check one, we have a thesis. Now what do we have to do? Well, you might say, <laughs> really, uh, prove it then I would have to come up with some reasons to back it up. Well, how about reason number one? Hawaiian pizza is both sweet and salty. Paired perfectly with salty, crispy strips of ham, pineapple helps lift the overall flavor profile of the pizza, using its sweetness to cut through the salt and create a heavenly taste sensation. Mmm. Quite frankly put, who doesn't love a sweet and salty combo? Reason number one. Hawaiian pizza is sweet and salty. Everybody loves sweet and salty. It's why we ate take five candy bars. Sweet. Salty. Delicious. Reason number two. Did you know that Hawaiian pizza has special health benefits? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it has pineapple on it. And as a fruit, pineapple is jam-packed with vitamin C, potassium, and fiber. So together, these nutrients, antioxidants, and antioxidants help enzymes within your body fight inflammation, boost immunity, and even aid digestion. Hashtag superfruit. Now, both of these uh, points come from evidence, or both of these passages, uh, are come from this website, Domino's Newsroom, which don't ask me what this website is. I have no idea. We'll talk a little bit later in the semester about digital literacy, and I did not practice my own preaching here. But nevertheless, <laughs> this all came from a website. Um, so the, the quotes that I just read you, right, these, these points about sweet and salty, they all come um, as pieces of evidence from a certain source. In this case, I don't know, a random website about Domino's. But I could present evidence from other sources. For example, how about a scientific study from scientific reports that says that healthy food choices are happy food choices? In other words, that when people make conspicuous choices to eat healthy food, they tend to report that they feel happier. This is what the scientists in this report kind of claim from their study. And if pineapples are in fact healthy food, well then pineapple pizza makes you happy. Hawaiian pizza is a happy pizza. This is why Hawaiian pizza is one of the best kinds of pizza. Or we could go about this by way of a warrant. So you wanna see a warrant in action. Uh, we might think of a warrant like this, right? Um, uh, don't people actually despise Hawaiian pizza? Well, Mashed, the website, again, don't ask me, I have no idea. Mashed, the website, polled approximately 32,000 people worldwide on their favorite pizza toppings and while Pineapple wasn't the winner. That title went to Pepperoni, of course, because, you know, Pepperoni. It did garner a surprising number of fans with 11% of respondents choosing it as their go-to topping. In fact, it didn't fare a whole lot worse than mushrooms or sausage. Pineapples were almost as popular as sausage. So this would be an example of a warrant, right? Oh, you might say that everyone hates it, but in fact, 11% of people reported it as their favorite topping and Almost as many people like pineapples on pizza 
as like sausage on pizza. Boom. Warrant. You're welcome. Okay, so another thing to think about when we're planning analytical essays is to think about the overall organization of the essay. And in history essays, there tend to be two different types of organizations. The first is chronological. This means that you start at one point in time and you go sort of down the chronological spectrum. You, you, you go in time, it, providing one kind of long narrative with broken up by analytical points in the middle. Right? This is a great way to organize a paper if what you're trying to emphasize is change over time. Right? Something began one way and then it, be, then it ended another way at a different point of time. The thing to remember about this, however, is that chronological organization isn't just an excuse to say, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Analytical essays are not just about telling stories. They're about proving points. Remember, not storyteller, lawyer. So if you approach something chronologically, you need to make sure that your narrative, your chronological narrative is broken up by analytical points, that at any given time, you're making some sort of argumentative point as you tell this long narrative. The second way to organize a paper is thematically. That means sort of focusing on analytical points with short narratives in between, right? That, that sort of animate those. This is what I did with the, the Hawaiian pizza thing. I approached it by thinking through certain analytical points and told stories to kind of illustrate those points and make them make sense. This is a great way for focusing on specific themes. If lots of things are going on at the same time in a historical period or at a historical time, well then thematic um, organization might be the way to analyze that thing. Now, the danger here is that you don't want to do thematic analysis or thematic organization if the themes you're thinking of are actually just different types of sources. As you will see when we talk about primary sources in this class, mixing of sources, different types of sources, and uh, lots of numbers of sources, uh, that's an integral process in creating a historical narrative. So you don't want to just sort of isolate themes by way of sources. But thematic organization can still be a really good way to organize an essay if you're trying to make sort of overlapping points at the same time. So my final tip here for approaching and planning an essay is that before you even begin writing, the first thing you should do is outline. Here, for example, is my outline for the stunning argument that I gave to you earlier about what the best pizza is. I wrote down just basically my question, my thesis, and then I broke down my thematic points with bits of evidence to support those points underneath each. This is a simple uh, argument or a simple outline. Um, you'll do things that are much more complex than this, but the point here is that I implore you to outline before you start writing any sort of history essay. Now we're gonna talk about the different sections of an analytical essay. We're gonna start with the introduction. Okay, let's dig into some of the parts of an analytical essay. And the very first thing that you do in an analytical essay is write an introduction. So we should ask ourselves first, what goes into an introduction? Number one, introductions tend to set up the topic of the essay. In history, this means kind of orienting the reader to the particular time and the particular place and maybe the particular people or subjects of the analytical essay. Sometimes this happens through what's called a vignette. Vignette is like a short story that is illustrative of these bigger things, of the, the sort of time, place, and um, maybe even the significant question that's being answered in the essay. And let me just say, before I move on to the others, that one thing that you should not do in a setup is start with some sort of meta sentence, some huge, broad sentence like, since the beginning of time, dot, dot, dot. Or, since all of human history, people have loved pizza, right? Um, avoid doing these huge, big, abstract starting points to essays. Instead, set up the essay by talking about the particular time, the particular place, the particular people that you're going to be dealing with in that essay. The second element of an introduction is the question. We've talked about this a little bit already, and I'll dive a little deeper into what makes a good historical question in a bit. But this is what needs to show up in an introduction, right? You have to present what is the main question of the study right away so that the reader knows exactly what you're trying to do. The third thing, of course, is the thesis. Again, we've already talked a little bit about this, and I'll go deeper into what makes a really good history thesis in a bit. But an introduction has to include a setup, 
to the time, place, you know, people that are going to be involved in the essay, the main question that's going to be solved, and the solution. And finally, a good introduction also provides signposts or sort of hints at what the main reasons of the argument will be. So an introduction includes both the thesis, the main answer to the question, and also the main reasons that help support that answer. Okay, let's dig deeper into two of these elements of the introduction. The first is questions. So what makes a good historical question? First, historical questions push beyond simple description. So here's an example of something that's not a great question for a historical analytical essay. What was it like living in fourth century Egypt? Great question to think about. I'm interested to know what it was like living in 4th century Egypt. However, it's not usually a good thing to ask a question where the main response is just description, right? If you remember from our previous video, history is about interpretation and argument. It shouldn't just be about the collection of facts. Second, good historical questions don't result in just a yes, no answer. Remember that history is complex. And so history essays should be about dealing with complexity, not about simplicity. So here's a good example of a not good historical question. Did smallpox affect Central American communities in the 16th century? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. What good historical questions will demand is a more complex response. Say, how did smallpox affect Central American communities in the 16th century? That would change this into a much better historical question for an analytical essay. Third, good historical questions are not about moral judgments. Uh, while historians do care about moral questions, and oftentimes history is used to think about morality and about ethics and things like that, in general, historians don't write about um, what they think was good or what they think was bad, right? They don't ask questions like, hey, was Theodore Roosevelt a good president? It's an interesting question to think about. Great question to maybe talk about with your friends over pizza. But um, it's not the kind of thing that you write in a historical analytical essay. Okay, finally, good historical questions are about what happened, not what could have happened. Uh, would the U.S. Patriots have won the Revolutionary War without the help of the French? Well, historians don't know how to answer that question, because we have to find evidence of things that did happen, and there isn't evidence of things that didn't happen. Okay, now let's take a look at theses. So what do good thesis statements look like? Well, first of all, good theses do not simply describe your topic uh, this is a common mistake with a lot of students who are writing their first history essays. They tend to say things, they tend to say that their, their thesis statement is something like this. This essay examines the role of women in the Mexican Revolution. Great sta statement, uh, fine sentence to have in the introduction, but really what that is, is a, a setup, right? That's a setup uh, in your introduction. That's talking about what you're going to talk about. It's identifying the, the who and when and where of your essay but it is not presenting an answer to a question. A thesis statement should be providing an answer, an interpretation. It should be a statement that demands some sort of backup, an argumentative statement. Second, good theses are not simple statements of facts. Henry VIII initiated the Reformation in England. Okay, that's fine. But history is about argument and interpretation. It's not just about statements of facts. Third, good theses are not statements of preference. Jahangir was the best emperor of the Mughal Empire. Maybe, you can think that, that's fine, but that's not a great thesis statement for an analytical essay in history. You shouldn't say, well, I like so-and-so the best. That's not the way that historians kind of do their work. Instead, historians focus their statements on interpretations of what they think happened and why and how. Okay, finally, good theses are specific and narrow. This happens a lot with students. Students are not quite sure of what they want to argue, so they'll say something like, many factors drove workers to participate in labor strikes in early 20th century Chicago. Again, this could be a true statement. Um, it could even, it's even argumentative in some sense, right? That recognizing that there is um, lots of things that went into driving workers to participate in labor strikes. However, you need to go deeper than that, right? Thesis statements need to be more specific than that. You shouldn't just say many factors. You should say what those factors are or what the main factor was that you think drove workers to participate in labor strikes. Okay, now it's time for the body of the essay, the real kind of meat and potatoes of what you're going to do. Okay, the body of an essay. What makes up the body of an essay? Well, the simple answer to this is paragraphs. 
Paragraphs are kind of the meat of the essay. And paragraphs tend to have three elements. The first is a topic sentence. This is the first sentence in the paragraph, and it does some very important things. First, it presents essentially a reason of your argument. Remember what arguments are made of. They're made of theses, reasons, evidence, and warrants. Topic sentences of paragraphs should be your reasons, the points that you make to build to or to support your main thesis. You should think of topic sentences like mini thesis statements. They should be argumentative claims. You should not start paragraphs with just a broad sentence like, now we'll talk about cooking in 12th century India. That is not, in fact, an argumentative sentence, right? You're not making some sort of claim or reason or interpretation in that. Instead, you should say something like, the introduction of pepper revolutionized cooking in 12th century India. This is something that demands an interpretation, it demands evidence, it demands you support it in some way. The second element of a paragraph is evidence. Basically, you should start a paragraph with a topic sentence that presents some sort of reason, and then you should follow that up with the evidence that supports that reason. Evidence comes in lots of different forms, but in general, um, most of the time, in history essays, it tends to be quotes that you pull from particular sources or specific data that you pull from specific sources. Anything that is concrete, specific, and helps you prove the point that you're making. Third, you should end a paragraph with a concluding sentence. And lots of different professors like lots of different things in concluding sentences of paragraphs. But what I think is the most important thing that a concluding sentence should do is it should be some sort of transition to the next paragraph, setting up the next point that you're going to make or the next uh, reason that you're going to present. Here's an example of what I think is a really great paragraph from a book from a former colleague of mine, David Courtright. Uh, the book is Forces of Habit. And here is a, a paragraph that I plucked kind of from the middle of the book. Here's what Courtright writes. Farms, monopolies, and other schemes that flourished during the golden age of drug taxation from the 17th through the 19th centuries made a perfect target for those fond of satirizing royal greed. The English diarist John Evelyn remarked that Charles II's government so depended on revenue from smoke and exotic drink that it would have sunk in all appearance had the people been as temperate as Christianity obliged. The jibe might have come from the pet of any wit in any European monarchy. The Russian crown was especially voracious. In 1859, rye that fetched two rubles on the open market brought 64 when distilled, taxed, and watered. It was finally sold in taverns. The alchemist would have envied a process that transmuted grain so readily to gold, David Christian has written. He adds that for all its fiscal importance, vodka drinking posed chronic problems of law and order for the Russian government. And then the next paragraph starts, many 12th century or 20th century officials had second thoughts about profiting from psychoactive commerce. And it goes on to sort of make another argument. But here you can identify a few key features to a great paragraph, right? The first is that the topic sentence is something that demands, that is interpretive, right? It is a good reason that demands the support of evidence. The second, of course, is that there is evidence in here. Quotations taken from the English diarist, a quotation taken from David Christian, some data from um, presumably from documents about um, prices of rye in Russia in the 19th century. All of these are pieces of evidence that help to support that uh, the way that drug taxation happened became a way that people criticized monarchies, right, or criticized uh, governments. And then finally, that last question there, talking about how there were also chronic problems attached to the consumption of vodka in the Russian government, was a great transition to talk about how some officials had second thoughts about profiting from these kinds of uh, commercial interactions. So it's a really great paragraph that has all the elements that we talked about before. Last but not least is the conclusion. How do we end an analytical essay? Ah, the dreaded conclusion. What do you do in a conclusion? Well, to be honest, every history professor that you have is going to have a slightly different answer to this. But let me tell you kind of the main things that I think should be in a conclusion. The first thing that you need to do in a conclusion is you need to remind the reader or your professor or whoever it is that's reading your essay how the argument that you made came together. So you have to think of it like this. If you begin your paper by asking a question and then providing an answer to that question. And then you go throughout the body of your paper, presenting the reasons that back up that answer and the evidence that support those reasons. The conclusion is your opportunity to tie all that together, to say, see, I told you so. Second, in a conclusion, you need to explain the significance of that argument. 
Why does it matter that you have definitively proven what the best pizza is? Well, this can go lots of different ways and it can um, be done in, in lots of different fashions, but somehow or another conclusion should end by talking about significance. And then finally, you should talk about anything else that's required of you from the assignment that you're doing or anything else that you want to kind of make of the analysis that you've just provided. In every paper assignment that I give, I always give a few tips on what I want in a conclusion, and they range um, depending on what the assignment is. So just pay attention to what it is you're trying to do and what your professors are looking for, and you'll know what else to add in your conclusion. Okay, so this was kind of a quick and really summary kind of guide to writing analytical essays in history. This doesn't cover everything. It's not going to solve all of your problems, but I really, really hope it helps. And yes, I need to acknowledge first and foremost that these are my tips. This is the Watkins Guide to Writing Essays. Other professors might push you in different directions and have you do different things. Um, in your other classes, you're going to write different types of essays. A history analytical essay is not the same as an analytical essay in, say, I don't know, sociology or psychology or some other discipline. It's a very sort of unique type of thing. But... What I hope is that this guide will give you kind of a starting point or a foundation for approaching essays of all varieties. Uh, hopefully the tips here will be useful no matter what you end up writing. And it'll especially be useful for the things that you write in this class. So feel free to go back and re-watch this video from time to time to remind, yourself, uh, remind yourselves of some of the good tips that are in here about writing. And always, always, feel free to come and talk to me about these things in office hours. I'm happy to help out, happy to look at drafts of things that you've written. I'm happy to do what I can to make you a better writer. Okay, that's it for this video. Good job, and I'll see you in class.